Hey everyone, welcome back to another great episode on Know Your Legends in Frequent Affairs. My name is Matt Jarbo and I'm going to be your host through this tale of the weird and wild and crazy world we have out there on this program. I'd like to thank all of you for listening from uh, iTunes and uh, Stitcher and Zoom and YouTube and our website and Twitter and Facebook and all over the web you guys find us. Thank you very much for listening. I definitely appreciate it. And I know that uh, my goal is to give you guys the best content that I can. So uh, without further ado, I'm just going to get right into it here. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about Area 51. Now, Area 51 is is a base that's been shrouded in mystery for years. Uh, we, uh, we know that the government didn't even acknowledge it for a long period of time. And everyone is just like, there's a base out there. There's a base. They have aliens. And that's where Roswell and... And everything, and, and there's a lot of great conspiracies about Area 51, but this is going to be more about the the technical aspects of the base, what the base has actually done, and of course, we are going to touch upon the UFOs and, and conspiracy theories about the place as well, because that's part of the, the folklore, part of the legend of Area 51, so uh, if you don't know much about it, you're going to learn a lot, it's going to be fantastic, it's going to be interesting, and you're going to go, oh, wow, I didn't know that they had much of an impact on our life the way that it did, so uh, let's get right into it right now. Uh, here we go. Area 51 is a military base and a remote detachment of the Edwards Air Force Base. It is located in the southern portion of Nevada in the western United States, about 83 miles north-northwest of downtown Las Vegas. Situated at its center on the southern shore of Groom Lake is a large military airfield. The base's primary purpose is support development and testing of experimental aircraft and weapon systems. The base lies within the United States Air Force's vast Nevada testing and training range, the NTTR, formerly called the Nellis Air Force Range, or the NAFR. Although the facilities at the range are managed by the 99th Air Base Wing at Nellis Air Force Base, the groom facility appears to be run as an adjunct of the Air Force Flight Test Center, the AFFTC, at Edwards Air Force Base in the Mojave Desert, around 186 miles southwest of groom. And as such, the base is known as Air Force Flight Test Center Detachment 3. Though the name Area 51 is used in official CIA documentation, other names used for the facility include Dreamland, Paradise Ranch, Home Base, Watertown Strip, Groom Lake, and most recently, Homie Airport. The area is part of the Nellis Military Operations Area, and the restricted airspace around the field is referred to as R-4808N, known as the military pilots in the area as the box or the container. The facility is not a conventional airbase, as frontline operational units are not normally deployed there. It instead appears to be used for highly classified military-slash-defense special access programs, or SAPs, which are unacknowledged publicly by the government, military personnel, and defense contractors. Its mission may be to support the development, testing, and training phases for new aircraft, weapons, systems, or research projects. Once these projects have been approved by the United States Air Force or other agencies such as the CIA and are ready to be announced to the public, operations of the aircraft are then moved to a normal Air Force base. The intense secrecy surrounding the base, the very existence of which the U.S. government did not even acknowledge until July 14, 2003, has made it the frequent subject of conspiracy theories and a central component to the unidentified flying object or UFO folklore. U.S. Government's Positions on Area 51 the federal government explicitly concedes in various court filings and government directives that the USAF has an operating location near Groom Lake, but does not provide any further information. Unlike much of Nellis Range, the area surrounding the lake is permanently off-limits to both civilian and normal military air traffic. Radar stations protect the area, and unauthorized personnel are quickly expelled. Even military pilots training in the NAFR risk disciplinary action if they stray into the exclusionary box surrounding Groom's airspace. Perimeter security is provided by uniformed private security guards working for EG&G security subcontractor Wackenhut, who patrol in Humvees, SUVs, and pickup trucks. The guards are armed with M16s, but no violent encounters with Area 51 observers have been reported. Instead, the guards generally follow visitors near the perimeter and radio the Lincoln County Sheriff. Deadly forces authorize if violators who attempt to breach the secured area fail to heed warnings to halt. Fines around $600 seem to be the normal course of action, although some visitors and journalists report receiving follow-up visits from FBI agents. Some observers have been detained on public land for pointing camera equipment at the base. Surveillance is supplemented using buried motion sensors. The base does not appear on any public U.S. government maps. 
The USGS topographic map for the area only shows the long-discussed Groom Mine. A civil aviation chart published by the Nevada Department of Transportation shows a large restricted area, but defines it as part of the Nellis restricted airspace. The official aeronautical navigation charts for the area show Groom Lake, but omit the airport facilities. Similarly, the National Atlas page showing federal lands in Nevada does not distinguish between Groom Block and other parts of the Nellis Range. Although officially declassified, the original film taken by U.S. Corona spy satellite in the 1960s has been altered prior to declassification. In answer to Freedom of Information queries, the government responds that these exposures, which map to Groom in the entire NAFR, appear to have been destroyed. Terra satellite images, which were publicly available, were removed from web servers including Microsoft Terra Server USA in 2004 and from the monochrome 1 uh, millimeter and from the monochrome 1 and resolution USGS data dump made by NASA Landsat 7 images are still available. These are used in NASA World Wind higher resolution and more recent images from other satellite imagery providers, including Russian providers and the Iconos, are commercially available. These show in considerable detail the runway marking base facilities, aircraft, and vehicles. Although federal property within the base is exempt from state and local taxes, facilities owned by private contractors are not. Area 51 researcher Glenn Campbell claimed in 1994 that the base only declares a taxable value of $2 million to the Lincoln County Tax Assessor, who was unable... Uh, who was unable to enter the area to perform an assessment. When documents that mention the NTS and operations at Groom are declassified, mentions of Area 51 and Groom Lake are routinely redacted. One notable exception is a 1967 memo from CIA Director Richard Helms regarding the deployment of three Oxcart aircraft from Groom to Kadena Air Base to perform reconnaissance over North Vietnam. Although most mentions of Oxcart's home base are redacted in the document, as is a map showing the aircraft's route from there to Okinawa, the redactor, the redactor appears to have missed one mention. Page 15, section 2, number 2 ends, three Oxcart aircraft and the Nis Although most mentions of Oxcart's home base are redacted in this document, as is the map showing the aircraft's route from there to Okinawa, the redactor appears to have missed one mention. Page 15, section number 2 ends, Three Oxcart aircraft and the necessary task force personnel will be deployed from Area 51 to Kadena. Facilities. Soviet spy satellites obtained photographs of Groom Lake area during the height of the Cold War, and later civilian satellites have produced detailed images of the base and its surroundings. Aerial imagery shows the airfield of Area 51 having seven runways, including one that now appears to be closed. The closed runway, 14R-32L, is also by far the longest with a total length of approximately 23,000 feet, not including a stopway. The other runways are two asphalt runways. In December 2007, airline pilots noticed that the base had appeared in their aircraft navigation systems listed as Homey Airport. The inadvertent release of the airport data led to advice by the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association that student pilots should be warned about KT or KXTA and not consider it a waypoint or destination for flight, even though it now appears in public navigation databases. Road access to the facility is with the Nevada State Route 375, where an access road connects to the public highway system. The security gate and parking facility is about 10 miles southwest of the road turnoff. The gate is approximately 25 miles from the main support base along a winding road. The support base has a series of what appears to be supply warehouses, dormitories, a fire station, some water towers, and a number of support buildings that are common on military bases. A very tall tower, perhaps used as the aircraft control tower, is also available. Open storage warehouses and what appears to be a reclamation yard is also visible. Recreation facilities include baseball diamonds and tennis courts. Several large satellite dishes, presumably for communications, are also visible. A large number of white-painted, presumably government vehicles, are visible in parking lots, mostly being pickup trucks, SUVs, and vans. Several Boeing 737 aircraft are parked on an open ramp, presumably for transportation of workers to its base. One military aircraft, appearing to be a black-painted F-16, is parked on another ramp, the black paint is commonly used by the Air Force for aircraft engaged in night operations. 
Several black painted helicopters are also parked on an open map. The base also has a large number of hangars, more than what is commonly found at a normal Air Force base, presumably to ensure operational aircraft are kept out of the view of orbiting reconnaissance satellites as well as the intense desert heat. Approximately 15.5 miles north-northeast of the base on a peak known as Baldy Mountain are a series of radars. At approximately 9,400 feet elevation, the types of radars at the site is unknown, although they may be the ARSR-4 air route surveillance radar, which is used by the Air Force and the FAA Joint Surveillance System throughout the United States. Another series of radar dishes of a different type are located on a ridge just to the north of Groom Lake, all of the radar sites appear to be automated and unattended. Approximately 85 miles to the northeast of the Area 51 airfield is an airstrip aligned 03-21 that is parallel to Route 6. This airfield is known as the Base Camp Airfield. There is no sign at the facility except U.S. government and to keep out. It is alleged that the facility is operated by a civilian government contractor personnel on behalf of the Air Fort Flight Test Center at Edwards AFB. It may be an auxiliary airfield for the Groom Lake Airfield. In addition to the single runway, there is a small residential compound, presumably for operations staff. Background Information World War II The first known use of the area was a construction in 1941 of an auxiliary airfield for the West Coast Air Corps Training Center at Las Vegas Airfield. Known as Indian Springs Airfield Auxiliary No. 1, it consisted of two dirt 5,000-foot runways, aligned northeast by southwest and northwest by southeast. The airfield was also used for bombing and artillery practice, as bomb craters are still visible in the vicinity of the runway. It was abandoned after the gunnery school at Las Vegas closed in June 1946. The U-2 Program The Groom Lake Test Facility was established by the Central Intelligence Agency for Project Aquatone, the development of the Lockheed U-2 Strategic Reconnaissance Aircraft in April 1955. As part of the project, the director, Richard M. Bissell Jr., understood the extreme secrecy in developing the project. The flight test and pilot training program could not be conducted at Edwards Air Force Base or Lockheed's Palmdale facility. A search for a suitable testing site for the U-2 was conducted under the same extreme security as the rest of the project. Bissell recalled a little X-shaped field in southern Nevada that he had flown over many times during his involvement with nuclear test programs. The airfield was the abandoned Indian Springs Airfield Auxiliary No. 1 field, which by 1955 had reverted to sand and was unusable. But the adjacent Groom Dry Lake to the northwest met the requirements for a site that was remote, but not too remote. He notified Lockheed, who sent an inspection team out to Groom Lake. According to Kelly Johnson, we flew over it, and within 30 seconds, you knew that was the place. It was right by a dry lake. Man alive, we looked at that lake, and we all looked at each other, and it was another Edwards. So we wheeled around, landed on the lake, taxied up to the end of it. It was a perfect natural landing field, as smooth as a billiard table without anything being done to it. Johnson used a compass to lay out the direction for the first runway. The place was called Groom Lake. The lake bed made an ideal strip from which they could operate the troublesome test aircraft, and the Immigrant Valley's mountain ranges and the NTS perimeter protected the test site from prying eyes and outside interference about 100 miles north of Las Vegas. On May 4, 1955, a survey team arrived at Groom Lake and laid out the 5,000-foot north-south runway on the southwest corner of the lake bed and designated a site for base support facility. The new airfield, then known as Site 2 or The Ranch, initially consisted of a little more than a few shelters, workshops, and trailer homes in which to house its small team. In a little over three months, the base consisted of a single paved runway, three hangars, a control tower, and a rudimentary accommodations for the test personnel. The base's few amenities included a movie theater and volleyball court. Additionally, there was a mess hall and fuel storage tanks. By July 1955, CIA, Air Force, and Lockheed personnel began arriving. The ranch received its first U-2 delivery on July 24, 1955 from Burbank on a C-124 Globemaster II cargo plane accompanied by Lockheed technicians on a Douglas DC-3. The first U-2 lifted off from Groom on August 4, 1955. A U-2 fleet under the control of the CIA began overflights of Soviet territory by mid-1956. The Groom Lake airfield soon acquired a name, Watertown. According to some accounts, the site was named after CIA Director Alan Dulles' birthplace, Watertown, New York. Upon its activation, the testing facility was used with increasing frequency for U-2 testing. However, that changed in 1957 when the Atomic Energy Commission began testing nuclear weapons and the 
However, that changed in 1957 when the Atomic Energy Commission began testing nuclear weapons at the nearby Yucca Flat facility. Once the AEC Operation Plumbob series of tests began with the Blotzmann Blast in 1957, the Watertown Airfield personnel were required to evacuate the base prior to each detonation. The AEC, in turn, tried to ensure that expected fallout from any given shot would be limited so as to permit re-entry of personnel within three to four weeks. All personnel at the base were required to wear radiation badges to measure their exposure to fallout. Once the atomic testing began, the CIA U-2 testing operations were interrupted consistently due to the explosions at Yucca Flat, which were scheduled and rescheduled frequently. The CIA facilities at Groom Lake were always considered by the agency as a temporary facility to accommodate U-2 testing. As the project began to wind down and CIA pilot classes finished their training, Watertown became a ghost town. By June 1957, most U-2 testing had moved to Edwards AFB and the first operational USAF unit to receive the U-2, the 4,080th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing, was active at Laughlin AFB, Texas. For two years following the departure of the U-2s from Groom Lake, the base was fairly quiet, although it remained under CIA jurisdiction. The X-15 Program In July 1959, the USAF personnel from Edwards AFB embarked on a two-day survey trip to investigate potential emergency landing sites for the North American X-15 rocket plane. The survey crew, the survey crew received permission to land on the then unused CIA facility at Groom Lake. The crew tested the hardness of the lake bed surface by dropping 10 pounds steel ball from the height of six feet and measuring the dynamic. The crew tested the hardness of the lake bed surface by dropping a 10 pound steel ball from a height of six feet and measuring the diameter of the resulting imprint. The result was that Groom Lake surface was considered excellent for emergency use. In September 1960, NASA and Air Force Flight Test Center personnel at Edwards reviewed the th results of the survey trip to Groom Lake, as well as other visits by the survey crew. The use of Groom Lake meant a uh, reduction in support requirements as there were an airfield with emergency equipment and personnel at the site. Ultimately, they agreed to remove Groom from consideration as an emergency landing site due to difficulty obtaining clearance to the area. The Oxcart Program even before U-2 development was complete, Lockheed began work on its successor as part of the CIA's Oxcart project involving the A-2, a Mach 3 high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft, a later variant of what became the famed USAF SR-71 Blackbird. As with the previous U-2 program, security requirements of the Oxcart project necessitated an obscure, secret location for A-12 testing. Despite the success of the U-2 flight tests and the Oxcart mock-up radar tests, Groom Lake was not initially considered. It was a Wild West outpost with primitive facilities for only 150 people. The A-12 test program would require more than 10 times that number. Groom Lake's 5,000-foot asphalt runway was both too short and unable to support the weight of the Oxcart. The fuel supply, hangar space, and shop space were all inadequate. Ten Air Force bases programmed for closure were considered, but all were rejected. The site had to be away from any cities and military or civilian airways to prevent sightings. It also had to have good weather, the necessary housing and fuel supplies, and an 8,500-foot runway. None of the Air Force bases met the security requirements, although for a time, Edwards Air Force Base was considered. In the end, Groom Lake was the only possibility. However, its short runway, Astaire facilities, and other shortcomings meant a major overhaul was necessary prior for Oxcar A-12 testing could commence. Groom Lake had also by this time received an official name. The Nevada nuclear test site was divided into several numbered areas to blend in, Groom Lake became Area 51. This aircraft flight characteristics and maintenance requirements forced a massive expansion of facilities and runways at Groom Lake. On October 1, 1960, Reynolds Electrical and Engineering Company began work on the site referred to as Project 51. Workers engaged in double shift construction schedules for the next four years to overhaul and upgrade base facilities, and also expand the existing runway to 8,500 feet, as well as harden the existing runway to support the heavier A-12. In addition, a new 10,000-foot runway was constructed diagonally across the southwest corner of the, of the lake bed. An Archimedes curve approximately two miles across was marked on the dry lake so that an A-12 pilot approaching the end of an overturn could abort to the playa instead of plunging the aircraft into the sagebrush. Area 51 pilots called it the hook. For crosswind landings, two unpaved airstrips were marked on the dry lake bed. By August 1961, construction of the essential facilities were completed. 
The United States Navy supplied three surplus hangars which were erected on the base's north side. They were designated as hangars 4, 5, and 6. A fourth, hangar 7, was new construction. The original A-12 hangars were converted to maintenance and machine shops. Facilities in the main cantonment area included workshops and buildings for storage and administration, a commissary, control tower, fire station, and housing. The Navy also contributed more than 130 surplus Babbitt duplex housing for long-term occupancy facilities. Older buildings were repaired and additional facilities were constructed as necessary. A reservoir pond, surrounded by trees, served as a recreational area one mile north of the base. Other recreational facilities included a gymnasium, movie theater, and baseball diamond. A permanent aircraft fuel tank farm was constructed in early 1962 for special JP fuel required by the A-12. Seven tanks were constructed with a total capacity of 1,320,000 gallons. Preparations began for the arrival of the ox cart. Security was greatly enhanced and the small civilian mine in the Groom Basin was closed. In January 1962, the Federal Aviation Administration, or the FAA, expanded the restricted airspace in the vicinity of Groom Lake. The lake bed became the center of a 600-square-mile addition to the restricted area R-4808N. Restricted continuously at all altitudes, the airspace occupies the center of the Nellis Air Force Range. Although remaining under the jurisdiction of the CIA, the facility received eight USAF F-101 Voodoos for training, two T-33 Shooting Star trainers for proficiency flying, a C-130 Hercules for cargo transport, a U-3A for administrative purposes, a helicopter for search and rescue, and a Cessna 180 for liaison use. And Lockheed provided an F-104 an F Starfighter for use as a chase plane. The first ox cart was covertly trucked to the base in February 1962, assembled, and made its first flight in April 1962. At the same time, the base boasted a complement of over 1,000 personnel. It had fueling tanks, a control tower, and a baseball diamond. The A-12 was large, loud, and distinctively looking aircraft. During its early test flights, the CIA tried to limit the number of people who saw the aircraft. All those at Groom Lake not connected with the Oxcart program were herded into the mess hall before each takeoff. This was soon dropped as it disrupted activities and was impractical with the large number of flights. Although the airspace above Groom Lake was closed, it was busy near the Nellis Air Force Base. Inevitably, there were sightings. Some Nellis pilots saw the A-12 several times. At least one NASA test pilot from Edwards AFB saw an A-12. He radioed the Edwards Tower and asked what it was. He was curtly told to halt transmissions. After landing, he was told that what he had seen was vital to U.S. security, and he also signed a security agreement. The major source of the A-12 sightings were airline pilots. This is believed to have been 20 to 30 airline sightings were made. One American Airlines pilot saw the A-12 twice. During one sighting, a pilot saw an A-12 and two chase planes. He radioed, I see a goose and two goslings. Groom saw the first flight of most major Blackbird variants, the A-12, the abortive YF-12A interceptor variant designed to intercept Soviet manned bombers, and the D-21 Blackbird-based drone project. By the end of 1963, nine A-12s were at Area 51. A mock-up of the Reconnaissance Strike 71, or the RS-71, was inspected by the Air Force on June 4, 1962. The concept of an A-12 with strategic bombing capabilities ran into political problems from both the Air Force, which was involved in the XB-7 Valkyrie program at the time, and a lack of enthusiasm from Defense Secretary Robert S. McNamara. McNamara and his whiz kids saw no need for additional manned bombers in the age of ICBMs. In addition, McNamara was phasing down the Air Defense Command and saw no use for the YF-12A interceptor. Accordingly, only the reconnaissance version of the RS-71 remained. It kept the strike part of the name, however. Where the A-12 was designed for clandestine overflights of Soviet territory, the RS-71 carried additional side-looking cameras and other sensors which gave it much greater capabilities. On December 28, 1962, a contract was issued to Lockheed to build six test R7, RS-71s. According to legend, President Lyndon B. Johnson asked an aide soon upon taking office after the Kennedy assassination what the RS-71 was for. The aide responded, strategic reconnaissance. Thus, when Johnson announced the existence of a new reconnaissance aircraft on July 24, 1964, President Johnson called it the SR-71. President Johnson's announcements created an unusual security situation. While the USAF SR-71 project was a white or open project, the CIA's A-12 was not. Its existence would remain a secret until 1981. To maintain the secret, those involved were told that the coming SR-71 announcement and warned to keep the A-12 separate. 
The SR-71 first flew at Lockheed facilities in Palmdale, California in December 1964, and Palmdale and Edwards Air Force Base served as the primary operation sites for that model. The 4200th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing activated at Beale Air Force Base on January 1, 1965. However, the first SR-71 did not arrive until January 7, 1966. The A-12s would remain at Groom Lake until 1968 and occasionally were deployed to other United States bases overseas. The CIA's nine remaining A-12s were placed on storage in Palmdale in June 1968. All surviving aircraft remained there for nearly 20 years before being sent to museums around the United States. Foreign Technology Evaluation During the Cold War, one of the missions carried out by the United States and was the test and evaluation of captured Soviet aircraft. Beginning in the late 1960s and for several decades, Area 51 played host to an assortment of Soviet-built aircraft. Under the Have Donut, Have Drill, and Have Ferry programs, the first MiGs flown in the United States were used to evaluate the aircraft in performance and technical capabilities, as well as in operational capability, pitting the types against U.S. fighters. This was not a new mission, as testing of foreign technology by the USAF began during World War II after the war testing of acquired foreign after the war testing of acquired foreign technology was performed by the Air Technical Intelligence Center, or the ATIC, which became very influential during the Korean War. Under the direct command of Air Material Control Department, in 1961, ATIC became the Foreign Technology Division, or the FTD, and was reassigned to the Air Force Systems Command. The ATIC personnel were sent anywhere where foreign aircraft could be found. The focus of the Air Force Systems Command limited the use of the fighter as a tool with which to train the front line of tactical fighter pilots. Air Force Systems Command recruited its pilots from the Air Force Flight Test Center at Air Edwards, who were usually graduates from various test pilot schools. Tactical Air Command selected its pilots primarily for the ranks of weapons school graduates. In August 1966, Iraqi Air Force fighter pilot Captain Munir Redfa defected flying his MiG-21 to Israel after being ordered to attack an Iraqi Kurd village with napalm. His aircraft was transferred to Nevada within a month. In 1968, the U.S. Air Force and Navy jointly formed a project known as Have Donut, in which the Air Force Systems Command, Tactical Air Command, and the U.S. Navy's Air Test and Evaluation Squadron 4, VX-4, flew this acquired Soviet-made aircraft in simulated air combat training. Because the U.S. possession of the MiG-21 was itself secret, it was tested at Groom Lake. A joint Air Force-Navy team was assembled for a series of dogfight tests. UFO and Other Conspiracy Theories Its secretive nature and undoubted connection to the classified aircraft research, together with reports of unusual phenomena, have led Area 51 to become a focus of modern UFO and conspiracy theories. Some of the activities mentioned in such theories at Area 51 include the storage, examination, and reverse engineering of crashed alien spacecraft, including material supposedly recovered at Roswell, the study of their occupants, living and dead, and the manufacture of aircraft based on alien technology, meetings or joint undertakings with extraterrestrials, the development of exotic energy weapons for strategic defense initiative or other weapons programs, the development of means of weather control, the development of time travel and teleportation technology, the development of unusual and exotic propulsion systems related to the Aurora program, activities related to a supported shadowy one-world government, or the Majestic 12 organization. Many of the hypotheses concern underground facilities at Groom or at Papoose Lake, and include claims of transcontinental underground railroad system, a disappearing airship nicknamed the Cheshire Airstrip after Lewis Carroll's Cheshire Cat, which briefly appears when water is sprayed onto its camouflage asphalt, and engineered based on alien technology. Publicly available satellite imagery, however, reveals clearly visible landing strips at Groom Dry Lake, but not at Papoose Lake. Veterans of experimental projects such as Oxcart and Nerva at Area 51 agree that their work, including the 2,850 Oxcart flight tests alone, inadvertently prompted many of the UFO sightings and other rumors. They believe that the rumors help maintain the secrecy over Area 51's actual operations, while the veterans deny the existence of a vast underground railroad system. Many of Area 51's operations did, and presumably still do, occur underground. Bob Lazur Several people have claimed knowledge of the events supporting Area 51's conspiracy theories. These have included Bob Lazar, who claimed in 1989 that he had worked on the, at Area 51 Sector 4 and said to be located underground inside Papoose Range near Papoose Lake. Lazar has stated he was contracted to work with alien spacecraft 
that the U.S. government had in its possession. Bruce Burgess. Similarly, the 1996 documentary Dreamland, directed by Bruce Burgess, included an interview with a 71-year-old mechanical engineer who claimed to be a former employee of Area 51 during the 1950s. His claims included that he had worked on a flying disc simulator, which had been based on a disc originating from a crashed extraterrestrial craft and was used to train U.S. pilots. He also claimed to have worked with extraterrestrial being named J-Rod and described as a telepathic translator. Dan Bursch. In 2004, Dan Burrish, a pseudonym of Dan Crane, claimed to have worked on cloning alien viruses at Area 51, also alongside the alien named J-Rod. Burrish's scholarly credentials are the subject of much debate, as he was apparently working as a Las Vegas parole officer in 1989, while also earning a PhD at SUNY. Okay, so Area 51... Lots of stuff. We we know that it was a military testing ground. We know that they that they created the stealth bomber there. That they tested all these planes there. Stuff that we you know that we know today uh, happened after the Cold War, after World War Two. You know when 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 st- stealing secrets wasn't something you, you hack on the internet. When it was something you actually have to send satellite planes over and 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 get the stuff that way. Uh, so it's up to you. What do you guys think? You guys think aliens? I mean, like I've always been a long time believer that there's been aliens and Area Fifty One, uh, the Roswell crash, all that stuff. I'm I'm like that. But I'm curious what you think. Please let us know at KZOMRadio.com on our Discuss forum. Uh, please let us know on Twitter at KZOMRadio uh, or Facebook.com slash KZOMRadio. Just Google it. You'll find it. We're there. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Today's episode is brought to you in part by Travis Wood and his mobile gamer podcast, the ins and outs of creating long-term passive income from a mobile application and a network of iPhone apps and Android apps. Learn marketing secrets while also creating an app for iPhone and iPad. iPhone apps and Android apps are growing at a tremendous pace. We explore lots of different app making tips, email marketing, search engine optimization, paid traffic, media buys, banner advertising, and various other marketing tips. We also cover the basics of how to make an app and the best iPhone apps to make you money. You can find more of that at iTunes. And also, this episode is brought to you by Dark Crooks, The First Tome, a new book by Rob Rodden Parker. Dark Crooks, The First Tome is the first in the series of horror or paranormal short story books that will shock, frighten, and excite you. The first book has four short stories that involve ghosts, evil spirits, an assassin, a demonic wraith, magical creatures, and zombies in space. So grab a copy, get cozy, and be sure to leave the lights on as you read through the four stories of terror and the supernatural. The link for this book can be found on our website, or just go to Amazon.com and look up Dark Crooks, the first tome. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Kazon Radio's Know Your Legends, Unsolved Murders. If you'd like to advertise on this podcast, please visit KazonRadio.com for details.